Hello, and to those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrew Cooper. I work for Citrix. I also wear a number of hats within the Zen community. And today, uh, we're going to talk about speculative side channels. So, nearly two years ago, I got a rather cryptic email uh, that came in, said security in the subject, and it was a request for a conference call arranged at my convenience. I went to my manager and said, this is probably not going to go terribly well, and two years later, here we are. Now, I thought we'd start with a bit of audience participation to begin with. We're a group of, um, uh, of knowledgeable CPU folk. How many speculative execution vulnerabilities do we know? Anyone? Shout out. Okay, let's start. Spectre. Meltdown, yep. MDS, yep. Uh, L1 terminal fault, yep. Any others? Sorry. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of specters. Um, we have a bit of a problem with terminology because we get both the technical names given uh, by Intel and various researcher uh, given names. I'm particularly fond of right transient forwarding as a name. It has a wonderful abbreviation. Um, two of the issues, however, that are commonly referred to as um, speculative issues, TL bleed and spoiler, are not. Um, TL bleed just it simply came out at around about the same time as everything else was. Spoiler is interesting. It's a regular uh, timing attack against a bit of the pipeline that is involved in speculation. So it it was reported as a speculative attack, but it really isn't. Uh, so. When you ask people what speculation is, they generally answer with a question, well, they answer with um, something that says, it's about speculative execution. And this is not, well, yeah, it's, it's true, it's the common case, but we actually get one of the vulnerabilities from speculative decode rather than speculative execution. Um, I guess that gets onto the question of why speculate, and apart from a very philosophical question there, the answer is, of course, performance. Uh, if you can uh, start an operation earlier than you need to, you can hide the latency. And in the common case, if you guess correctly, you did, the, you did correct work earlier on and everything goes faster. This is great. Well, it was great two years ago. It's rather less great now. A lot of the issues fall into, well, they all fall into one of two categories. Either uh, someone, either an attacker can cause incorrect prediction to occur. Um, so that's um, Spectre and uh, Speculative Store Bypass. Uh, a lot of the other issues uh, handle, uh, are to do with how uh, faults are detected and uh, changed in the uh, how, how they're detected and handled in the pipeline. A lot of fault checking has been deferred until instruction retirement for simplicity, but it turns out this uh, opens up a lot, of, uh, a lot of attack avenues. And in most cases, it's to do with various shared resources in the pipeline. So the branch predictors uh, uh, are shared, some partitioned, internal data buses, some shared, some partitioned. L1 data cache is the very common example because it's the easiest for people to understand. It's also coherent across the system, which leads to uh, a couple of interesting uh, combinations. So, I guess uh, starting at the beginning, Spectre v1. Uh, this is the most simple to explain. It is also the most complicated to fix. Uh, in, in this case, an attacker poisons or trains the conditional branch predictor, which in practice lets you lets an attacker control whether you, uh, which bit of an if-else condition that gets run. In, 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 in the attack case, uh, a, a, an attacker poisons it to cause the basic block to be executed with the wrong register context. The example given by Google um, uh, at the beginning of 2000 and 18 uh, was a, a double memory read, so an outer, uh, an out of bounds array read, and a second uh, dependent memory read. Uh, it's incredibly easy to construct in JIT code. It's less common in compiled code, so the big problem here are web browsers, but also things like 
uh, BPF filters in the kernel. Those were both uh, very common attack cases. Mitigating it is incredibly complicated if, if statements are everywhere in code. For general arrays, a lot of cases you can get away with putting an extra data dependency in there. Um, it doesn't work everywhere though. There are some processors that do get data value speculation as well as everything else, and they fall down completely here. Uh, anyone that was keeping up with the ARM side of things will note that ARM actually specified a new instruction uh, to be a speculation barrier, and uh, they didn't do that just because they wanted to. There was a reason for it. In general, the only solution that we currently have to Spectre uh, attacks like this is to resynchronize execution after a conditional jump instruction. The conditional jump instruction can be taken over by the attacker, so you need to execute that instruction, then check that it was correct before you enter the rest of the basic block. Uh, on x86, we do this by putting an L fence at the top of the basic block, and remember we have to do it on both because an attacker can poison taken or not taken uh, in both cases and, are, are, and can have a lot of fun here. The biggest problem is that no one has any idea how to fix this in hardware. There's a lot of academic research out uh, that uh, has proposed various ideas, and from an academic standpoint, they're great ideas. They're less great ideas uh, when you try uh, applying real silicon or uh, uh, processor internals to the problem. So at the moment, it, it is still a very open problem how to actually do this. The, the, the reason it's so problematic is that it's very context dependent as to whether data is attacker controlled or not, as to whether it's safe to speculate based on the value of. The worst part about Spectre v1 is not actually the example Google gave to begin with. It's the other variations we get of it. Uh, one of them is, uh, is type confusion. So we've got a lot of cases in the hypervisor. We've got struct vCPU, we've got struct domain. Um, Anytime you've done a is PV domain, do something else, do something else, we have a case for speculative type confusion by just accessing the wrong part of a union. The, the worst version of that is actually is priv domain, I, are you DOM zero, are you allowed to do something else, um, uh, else not. Um, the other example here is the arbitrary cache load gadget, which is just the first half of Spectre, uh, of, of the example given by Google. So a single if condition, a single out of bounds memory read. That is incredibly easy to find in code, incredibly easy to speculate over because it's one instruction to speculate on. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, pulling arbitrary things into the cache is a very useful thing to do later on. Now at the same time, um, a slightly different variation of Spectre came out. This is called branch target injection, and it, uh, it um, targets a different prediction uh, primitive in the, um, in the branch predictor. It's called the branch target buffer, which is used to try and guess where function pointers are going to end up. Uh, the, uh, also for uh, indirect jumps, which is how you typically implement a, um, a switch jump table. Uh, it's a common optimization for compilers to do. Now, this is much worse than Spectre v1. It starts by, uh, it allows an attacker to take control of execution. You can point it to an arbitrary bit of code in the kernel, in the hypervisor. Uh, you can point it to a misaligned instruction like uh, rock programming, rock gadgets. Or you can point it back into user space to put your own set of instructions for leaking data into it. Um, so on the whole, this is a much more important issue to fix than Spectre v1 because it allows an attacker much more flexibility. There are some ideas to uh, do some microcode features. Uh, the problem with the microcode features is they're very, very slow. So, uh, Google put together a technique called a repline. It's a contraction of re uh, ret trampoline. Um, and it works on the fact that ret instructions are predicted differently to call and jump instructions. Uh, this is the, in Intel's naming terms, this is the return stack buffer. AMD, it's the return address stack. It relies on the fact that 
call and return instructions, or, uh, or you, you always return to immediately after a call instruction, so hardware maintains a stack. Um, call instructions push an entry onto the stack, ret instructions take an entry off the stack. This is great, but of course, it can't be an arbitrarily sized stack. It turns out it's implemented as a circular stack. And it can underflow. You can overflow, it can underflow. Uh, in old CPUs, when it underflows, it just goes back around to the top, starts again. It's not terribly performant, but it's safe as far as our use case goes. Skylake processors had a different bug here. Um, they said, oh, this, this underflow, the return stack buffer, that's not terribly good, but it's just, like a, it's just like a function call write. We've got a predictor for that. It's called the branch target buffer. Um, as a result, uh, Skylake, uh, an attempt to make Skylake processors faster meant that Repeline is not safe to use on them uh, because it falls back to the predictor we're attempting not to use in the first place. So on Skylake CPUs, we've got no option. We have to go with the microcode features. Um, the microcode features are irritating to use, to, to say the least. Um, they've got a weird ABI. Um, the reason for that was it incorporated both the intended fix long term as well as what microcode could currently do in the pipelines of the existing CPU. So it, it's got a weird interface, but it, it was the only way it could be done like that. So uh, one feature, there's IBRS, which is indirect branch redict, um, reduced speculation, which is trying to prevent user space from being able to poison kernel space. STIBP for single thread indirect branch prediction, which is to prevent cross hyper thread attacks. And the uh, IBPB at the bottom, which is a full flush of the branch target buffer. It's incredibly expensive, but we need to do it on vCPU context switches. Uh, on future hardware that's coming out, there's a feature called enhanced IBRS that has some actual real silicon behind this, and we will need to opt in to use it. Yeah, well, that's, that's fine, there, there, there's a plan there. At the same time, uh, this great one called Meltdown came out. Uh, this is rather easier for an attacker to use. It, you, as an attacker, you construct a pointer into kernel space, read from it, and you get the data that was there, despite the fact that you violated the page permission that said this is only for the kernel. Now, the reason this occurs is because uh, the, uh, the protection check is deferred until retirement uh, of the instruction, so there's a period of time between doing the memory access and the pipeline realizing you weren't actually allowed to do that, and in the meantime, you can steal all the secrets and leak them via a cache timing attack. This requires both a TLB hit and an L1 data cache hit, um, at, at which point you get access to it, and it can be pulled off from user space with unprivileged instructions. Now, of course, you can't just sit there and tell user space it can't use mob instructions or add instructions, because that's just not a viable, a viable way to fix it. Uh, the mitigations for it, there were a number of options available. One was to flush the data cache, one was to flush the TLB, or another option was to consider what you uh, think is sensitive and put it in uncached memory, because of course if it's uncached, it can't end up in the data cache. Um, it might be an easier way to hide certain secrets. Flushing the L1 data cache was considered very expensive, therefore we chose not to do it, uh, and went with flushing the TLB instead. So this ends up with split user and kernel page tables, changes on every context switch, it's expensive, it's incredibly invasive to uh, the entry points, uh, but it prevents TLB hits. Um, it's got various names in various different places. Linux calls it KPTI for kernel page table isolation. We call it XPTI based on the same name. Windows calls it kernel virtual address space shadow, I think is the name of it. On a lot of CPUs that are out there, there's actually a feature called process context identifiers that no one was using before this and actually makes a lot of the performance hit go away uh, because at that point you're not fully flushing the TLB and things work a lot better. Um, the fix in hardware, again, will appear at around about the same time. There's a new bit called RDCL No, which says, hey, I'm not vulnerable to all of this stuff. So 
These three issues were published at the beginning of January last year, and immediately following it, there was a lot of work went in from academics. So here are a couple of brief mentions. Uh, there's a Spectre V1 variant, where instead of doing an out-of-bounds read, you do an out-of-bounds write. Um, this allows you to do speculative stack smashing, um, and that leads to some fairly fun things. You can speculatively overwrite the return address on the stack, and uh, that disappointingly does the attacker helpful thing, not the defender helpful thing. Uh, in code that we have in the hypervisor, we've got uh, array access no spec, which we use both on array reads and array writes, because the array writes here uh, tend to be rather more interesting for an attacker to take over. The other interesting thing here was the fact that you could combine this with Meltdown. With, with Meltdown, for a while, the read-write permission bit isn't checked, which means you can update RO data. You can, for a brief period of time, you can take control of read-only memory, read-only data in the process, and cause it to do uh, weird and random things with it. That's all great fun. Don't recommend any of it. Uh, we've just got to make sure that, a write, that writes into arrays are speculatively safe. Um, there's no other way of do it, dealing with it. The next big one that came along was a thing called speculative store bypass, which is the other example of misprediction. Uh, it's much better described as memory access misprediction. Uh, to speed up memory accesses inside the CPU, um, the processor tries to guess which are not aliasing, so can do them out of order, and the issue here was that uh, there are cases where it gets this wrong, it moves the load ahead of a dependent store and uh, executes with stale data. Uh, it, the most problematic case here is where you've got a compiler, a, either a, a regular compiler or a JIT, that reuses a stack slot for, a, for what is logically a new um, object. So again, have to be very careful how you write to your own stack there. Around about the same time, there was a paper called NetSpecter, and if you haven't read it, I highly recommend you go and read it. It's an excellent paper. Uh, they demonstrated uh, an L1 uh, cache timing attack via network packet latency. They read an SSH server private key across a data center using nothing but uh, timing data on the network packets. Uh, the, and that's an interesting read, but the more the, the, <laughs> the worst bit in it uh, was they discovered a quirk of AVX instructions. The vector pipeline is a big piece of silicon and people don't want it powered up all the time. So for power efficiency reasons, it's, it's powered down. But that means it needs to be powered up to use. And of course, this is keyed off speculatively decoding an AVX instruction. Uh, to do this, the, uh, the processor has to drop the frequency of the CPU because it's the only way not to brown out the rest of the silicon from the inrush current to power the vector unit. As a result, you see, uh, as soon as the speculative decode hits uh, an AVX instruction, the frequency of the processor drops substantially for a while. And it turns out this is a much, much more easily observable signal over the network uh, than anywhere else. Uh, the problem there is there are no instructions you can use to stop it happening because superscalar processors decode multiple instructions together. You cannot put a, uh, an execution serializing instruction in because it doesn't serialize decode. Uh, no one has any fix for that. I hear some of the new processors are going to be have a rather slower frequency change. Um, the other uh, special mention here is a thing called lazy FPU. So back in the uh, back in the Jurassic age of the 486 processor, it was very expensive to change floating point state, and um, optimizations were put in place to check when you were using it and not save and restore it most of the time. Certain legacy code, I a lot in the world, still did that up until this point. Uh, now the, uh, the fix here is to, uh, is to do what Intel have actually suggested for a while in their manual, which will switch to eager uh, floating point um, uh, restoration. And this actually netted us a performance win. We had a security fix that came with a performance win in it, and everyone was happy. Well, other than uh, having to zero day the entire world with it. Um, that was a little bit rare, but um, we like it anyway. <laughs> 
A little bit later uh, in, in, in the summer, about a year ago now, uh, L1 Terminal Fault came along. Now, this looks quite a lot like Meltdown. Um, in, in x86 terminology, a terminal fault is a page warp which doesn't complete. Either the present bit is not set or other reserved bits were not set. Now, the problem is that to speed up the page warp, which is an important um, bit of the pipeline, um, it, the, well, the, the, the page warp hardware speculatively computes the next, uh, the next level PTE and goes and fetches it from the L1 data cache. Um, in reality, it's either, the, it's either the next PTE on the walk or it's the, uh, or it's the target data. Either way, bringing that into the data cache is a useful thing to do. Um, how many? You're holding the... <laughs> oh, three minutes, right, okay, I'm, I'm getting really behind. Um, the problems here is that uh, this completely went and bypassed um, SMM mode, EPT protections and SGX protections. Um, and it's quite easy for user space to do. Their mProtect uh, -Pro system call will let you do this. Um, in the virtualized case, the guest kernel controls the page table and we can't, uh, we can't change them at all. Interestingly, this came and caused two completely different ways of fixing it. One for native, where we invert all the PTE bits and that works because, um, because of SKU. Um, the, uh, the actual uh, data width of the L1 uh, cache is wider than reported by the CPU, uh, so that causes a cache miss. For the virtualized case, however, we've got no option but to flush the L1 data cache, which, was, if you remember, was the thing we decided was quite expensive to do before. You've also got to disable hyperthreading because if we go back originally to Spectre V1, you've got an arbitrary data cache load gadget that you can do on one hyperthread and read it uh, the moment it comes into the cache on the other hyperthread here. So disabling is the only option we've got. Then a year later, we get to microarchitectural data sampling, which has spent ages, um, uh, in, in, in ages coming to fruition. This is all to do with the internal data buffers, so the load ports, the store buffers, the fill buffers, the load ports are uh, for memory reads, the store buffers hold uh, currently speculative writes that are in the process of being uh, retired and become non-speculative, and the fill buffers are used for all writes leaving the pipeline, so post-retirement and on their way to the, to the cache. Um, in this case, an attacker constructs a misaligned pointer and reads from it, or alternatively, a pointer that sets an access or dirty bit. Uh, it turns out uh, the implementation does the same thing. Um, this has an interesting quirk in it that it means you can read from uncached memory because uncached memory still passes through the load ports and the fill buffers. So the original idea for meltdown protection, which was put stuff in uncached memory, doesn't quite work as well uh, as uh, as originally believed, and there was at least one vendor that did put encryption keys in uncached memory and had to uh, go and undo that for uh, a, la uh, a later uh, fix. Uh, to mitigate this, uh, we take a legacy instruction that was only useful in the 286 processor, so even before 32-bit, uh, and give it a new side effect of flushing the cache. Um, similarly to the L1 uh, cache flush, there's a Again, we have to disable hyperthreading because the load and the fill buffers let you read uh, the memory operands of whatever happens to be on the other hyperthread at the time, be it another bit of user space, a different virtual machine, the kernel, uh, the hypervisor, or indeed, um, uh, or indeed uh, an SGX uh, thing. Uh, again, fixed in hardware with MDS No. Uh, interestingly, Intel accidentally fixed this with the meltdown mitigations, which is why uh, it's all part of it's already fixed with uh, RDCL No. So um, this is basically where we've got to at the moment. We've got a whole load of issues. Um, the completed work is the immediate fixes. Uh, those all went out with various XSAs. Things we've got in, develop at the moment, in development at the moment, there's the core aware scheduling, which we've already had a presentation on. Uh, there are two bits, of, uh, two bits of work I'm working on at the moment. Uh, MSR Arch Caps is the control register that lets us tell uh, hardware e if it has to, uh, e either it's running on fixed hardware or alternatively uh, cases where we tell it it's definitely not safe. 
Um, and uh, this thing called half spectre V1 hardening, which is um, a work in progress uh, to try and reduce the ability to leak data uh, when hyperthreading is uh, still enabled. And um, a future work we've got is enhanced IBRS that no one started yet, I'll get to that eventually, and uh, various uh, mapping removals in Zen, which we had a presentation from Wei on earlier. So I suppose at that point I should probably stop for questions. Nobody. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Well, you that. answered everything up. Oh. <laughs> More of a heckle than a question. You said Red Pauline doesn't work on Skylight Plus. Now, that's not strictly true. It's not sufficient. It's because not that cool and red. That is going to be in the stack. That's not really going to get taken from the BTB, but any arbitrary deep call stack might trigger might. Uh, a so the, for the, the BTB. So in general, Repoline does work, but there are cases where we can't guarantee the safety of it. Uh, uh, so also if you take an NMI, if you take an SMI, all of that uh, can go and empty the call stack on you. The, basically, it's, it, there's no ability to construct a Repoline that is arguably safe. Um, on Skylake, which is why we go and use the slower options. Yeah, that as well. Anyone else? Last one. Oh. All right. Thank you, but we have some admin stuff I need to tell you as well, so please stay for a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you, Andrew.